Welcome to my 27th episode of Guitar Players in Isolation. Today's guest is Chris Burkett. Chris is an award-winning producer, mixer-engineer, singer-songwriter, and a damn good guitar player. We talk about how he started his career as a guitar player in the UK, and then, after meeting and working with legendary producer Tony Visconti, he began what has become an incredible career as a producer himself. His most successful work was producing Sinead O'Connor's album, I Do Not Want What I Haven't Got, and this included that mega, mega hit, Nothing Compares to You. Chris is now a Canadian, and he's living right here in Toronto. It's been a real honor to be able to sit down and talk with him. Well, virtually. If you're new to my channel, thanks. And I hope you can subscribe. Just hit that subscribe button. Maybe even hit the like button. Or leave a comment. All these kind of interactions help the YouTube algorithm show out the videos more. And I'd greatly appreciate that. Also, if you get the chance, take a look at all the other interviews I've done. There's 26 other ones with great Canadian guitar players. All right, let's get started. Hey, Chris, how are you? Fine, how are you? I'm, <laughs> I'm doing well and, uh, you know, thrilled to have you as a guest. I got introduced to you uh, by Eric Alper, who I uh, interviewed. Uh, Mutual friend? Uh, yeah, two interviews ago was, was by Eric. Uh, so that was nice of him to make the introduction. I'll admit, the name didn't ring a bell when he introduced, uh, when he sent it to me. But then, quick Google, and I was like, holy shit. <laughs> like, <that's, laughs> what a career he's had. And he decided to, you know, make his home Toronto. So, so that's yeah. cool. You're, you're new to Toronto from 2012. Yeah. You know, uh, originally, I guess, I guess from some part in England, I'm guessing. Uh, yeah, well, no, actually, do you, want, do you want a quick, a brief story? How, how well, I we'll, we'll get into all that, yeah. but... Uh... Yeah, well, I'm from London. I'm just from a town called Farnborough, just outside London, England. Okay, yeah. I was, born, I was born in Aldershot, and funnily enough, there's an Aldershot here. It's near Burlington. So yeah, yeah, a, yeah. Of... <laughs> a little <laughs> I come, different. I've come back home. <laughs> That's great. Uh, I'll just do a quickie on... And then, and then we'll, you know, we'll spend the next hour getting into it all, but just a quickie, like... For what I found out when I when I Googled you, uh, some of the big highlights. I mean, you 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 started off as a guitar player, and then uh, and we'll get into how you you know you got into producing. But some of the producing highlights, you know, I'm, I just recently turned fifty, so some of this stuff that you did like in the late '80s was just like, you know, this is stuff that you know I grew up on, right? Like so. <laughs> Dixie Midnight sound. Runners, Dixie Midnight Runners. I mean, oh, the yeah. sound quality on that stuff was was amazing. Still is when you listen to it now. Thomas Dalby, another one who did high fidelity kind of stuff. I mean, yeah, yeah. And, and then your biggest, probably, you know, that you're known for is recording Sinead O'Connor. Nothing compares to you. And I, I can't think of a bigger song from the, you know, yeah, that was probably, huge. Yeah. That's probably the one that sold the most out of all the stuff I've worked Yeah, with. just incredible. Yeah. And then you work not on the song, but on some cuts on Steve Earle's Copperhead Road album. I mean, anybody yeah. my age is like, that's a, this is monstrous kind of stuff. The Proclaimers, the, the Progues, Talking Heads. Yeah. And then a lot of work was with your most recent stuff was uh, Buffy St. Marie. So that's yeah. kind of, and then you've been, you kind of went back into uh, being an artist yeah. And doing some solo recording, which brought you back to here, home, Toronto, yeah. and uh, you know, doing shows and, and playing, and 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 a whole bunch of interesting string instruments that we see in the background. So, oh yeah, that's that's just a that's just a small snapshot. I mean, <laughs> yeah, my, I'm actually surrounded by. Uh, yeah, by stuff. You know, I, probably, I could probably give you a guided tour if you want, but <laughs> we will talk about some of the, Yeah, because I I saw a post on your Facebook that you still have a crap load sitting in Paris. Uh, well, actually, it's all it's been shipped over now. Oh, good, I, good. I finally got it over. Yeah, I I did because I had a studio in Paris for between uh, 2006 and 2012 before it came here, and uh, it was uh, all that stuff went into storage and it was just stuck there for yeah. a while. For years, you know, I, I couldn't really, I couldn't get the wherewithal to get to get it together to get it over here, and I did. But I actually finally got it all shipped over last year. So, oh, great! So, uh, some yeah. of it's in um, Newmarket. I'm building a studio up in Newmarket with uh, Paul Dutton of Snatch. How's that yeah. going? I I did hear about that. It's, it's kind of slow, but the, you know, he's yeah. got the, the the building's really nice, it's beautiful. Uh, 
the original building that he moved out of because of the COVID thing. They, they yeah. kind of like scale everything down. So now we've got a place on the main street in uh, New York. Okay. Really nice. And uh, it's just, it's just bit by bit, but most, a lot of my stuff, like my drum kits and the, the big stuff, a lot of guitar amps and stuff like that, they're all, uh, st- Still in uh, storage in in Newmarket until okay. we get the whole place ready. So it's, it's but, been a it's been a slow process because of the uh, lockdowns, basically. Sure, it's hard to get uh, yeah. you know the staff in construction and all yeah. that with all the restrictions. But yeah, that's but that's bring, great. I, I did bring all my stuff that I would need for immediate metal production. You know, like my mandolins and bazooki and woods and ba- banjos and uh, all the stuff I've got in this room. I love it. I brought, that's great. I brought all that. Uh, out of the storage from Newmarket and put, put it all in this, crammed it all into this room so, so I can get to things quickly, you know. That's great because, <laughs> uh, you know, I'm from north, north of the city here, uh, Richmond Hill, and my drummer, he's, uh, he's in Newmarket. So uh, when you're up and running, I, I, I got to check out the oh, place. Oh, right. Well, actually, I'm, I might be looking for a drummer because we're thinking of doing, when the studio's ready, we're thinking of running a kind of Daryl's house kind of thing. Do you know, oh, do you know, wow. Do you know yeah. Daryl's house? That's one of the greatest things on YouTube. Yeah, so so we're do Cana- we want to do the Canadian version. I'm going to invite some, you know, like uh, high priority, high profile guests. Hey, and from my yeah. channel, if you need uh, good guitar players, well, you know, I can play a few chords. But uh, yeah, well, that's it. Well, that's I know it. all the greatest guitar players. I, I interviewed a whack of them. <laughs> well, I worked with, with uh, Neil Chapman, who lives up that way. It's, well, Neil was in a band, was in Buffy St. Marie's band with me. Oh, okay. And Neil played. Funny enough, Neil played bass. And I was okay. playing guitar, and I didn't realize what an awesome guitar player he was at the time. Oh, you know, for we're, sure. We're yeah, playing all over the place. And we're playing in you know, different countries with Buffy, and they're also all around the Northwest Territories and you know, places like Yellowknife and stuff. And That's then, great. You know, it wasn't until I moved here, and then I went to one of his gigs and saw him playing. I thought, wow, he's much better <laughs> than me. What's it? What's it? What's it? What's it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm sure you've discovered since 2012 moving to Toronto, the city is packed with talent. Like yeah, it's, yeah, you it's, know, it's fantastic. I love it. There's there's so many great musicians in the in the GTA area. It's it's yeah. unbelievable. You know, the, the thing, the, one of the main things I like about Canada, and it's the reason why I became a citizen of Canada, and you know, just made decided to make this place my home, is it's this whole country that is a mosaic of culture. Oh, for sure, and, yeah. And uh, I'm very, very into world music. I used to work. I worked with, a few times with Peter Gabriel back in the yeah. Uh, and uh, and I built I built a studio very much like his because I I was really uh, I was full of admiration for what he was doing. You know, he discovered Nusrat Fatah Ali Khan, you know, the Sufi singer from from Pakistan and stuff like that. Yeah. But, so I bought the chateau in uh, 1993, 1991. Actually, I bought the chateau, the 32 room chateau, and I spent two years getting it made into a studio and and uh, combination. And then I, I I did the same thing as Real World, but in the south of France. Wow. Yeah, that so was, was in Bordeaux, right? Yeah. 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 So that, oh, was, that, was because, cool. that was because of my contact with Peter, and I, I was just really impressed with what he was, he was doing, you know. Yeah, and it's funny you mentioned uh, Peter Gabriel, and, and, and um, there's, there's a cool story that I, I've heard that you've told, but we're going to hold and, and, and <laughs> hold that, that a little later. But <laughs> yeah. in our correspondence by email, you, you know, you flipped me a couple tunes that you had a previous guest of mine, uh, uh, Tristan Avakian, play on that we, we just mentioned. And um, when I listened to it, it reminded me right away of Peter Gabriel. <laughs> yeah, I like get, it, I, it had I, that get. feel, it had that sound. And you kind of have, you have that, uh, a similar buzz to the tone on your voice. Yeah, you know, it's, I, actually, it's not the first time of people have said that. It's, yeah. Uh, on, on my... Uh, debut album when i decided to get back into you know doing my own music again in london i re- released an album called men from the sky okay and uh, that was at the time i was actually working with peter and I, you know i've met him a few times and you yeah know, he was he was hanging around with Sinead o'connor at the time actually so I met him yeah, all right so let's lot. tell that story he, he oh, was yeah, sitting yeah, well, in the back <laughs> yeah. anyway, a, lot, a lot of people when they heard that album that that album was uh, uh ed bicknell who's the manager of dire straits Okay. When he heard that record, he phoned me out. He said, this is the best record I've heard in seven years. He said, you've got to come into my office. So I went in to see him, and he picked out the phone, got me a deal with Polydor Records, just, just from a phone call. That's how powerful he was, right? So wow. It's uh, it pretty cool. But anyway, the, um, yeah, the Sinead O'Connor story, I was, I was working on uh, I Do Not Want What I Haven't Got, the album. Yeah. And uh, we were doing some of the truck 
cuts at uh, Westside Studio in, in uh, London. And so she would come in, you know, for about five or six days, she'd, she'd come in with this guy, with a uh, very quiet, shy person with a pair of sunglasses. And she'd come in, he wouldn't say a word, and he'd go and sit behind me, at, behind my desk while I was working, the console. Yeah. And just say nothing. And so I, and I, 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 was, I immediately sort of judged him. I thought, what? What a prick, you know, wearing, a pair, <laughs> wearing sunglasses in a dark recording studio. What, what do you need that for, you know, kind of thing. So I was kind of, you know, a bit judgmental. So anyway, one day I just, like the second day I was there, I sort of said, so, oh, uh, hi, I'm, I, I thought I'd better just, you know, communicate. I said, hi, I'm Chris, how are you? You know, I got, got friendly to him. And uh, he said, oh, I'm, I'm Peter Gabriel. And I said, <laughs> 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 actually, actually I, didn't do, I didn't make that connection until three or four days and I, I just thought I've been sitting here with this, this genius <laughs> yeah. four days I didn't even know who it was <laughs> that's amazing <laughs> that's yeah, got to yeah. be a weird feeling all right so yeah. let's uh, let me, I'll let you tell some of your story here um, it's funny because in, in all the research I've heard it multiple times but nobody <laughs> I'm sure a lot of my listeners haven't so you know kind of got going going to tech kind of school but then hooking up with with a band in Germany and then linking up with the famous Tony uh, Tony Visconti uh you know of David Bowie fame bass player and the producer of countless records by him yeah. and then that just kind of launched everything for you so yeah give us that give us that little story oh just give a quick rundown yeah well, yeah um, it's a great story yeah well I was, <laughs> I was uh I was kind of it starts off from me running away from home at 19 because I had yeah. a thoroughly miserable childhood and me and my sister were being brought up by a wicked step monster so who hated us and just used to give us sugar and pig fat sandwiches to eat every day and left us out standing out in the rain and well, it, was, it was really miserable but I was doing an electronics degree at the time so my dad wanted me to do but when I finished that I just said I just thought uh, that what actually changed I had an epiphany and I'll describe the epiphany too because it's really interesting uh, the, the, the college where I was studying le- aircraft electronics they used to book really good bands like Pink Floyd and, you know, so anyway, Led Zepp, you know, anyway, uh, Deep Purple came one weekend and, and uh, I was standing in front of Richie Blackmore and he's playing uh, the, the solo to Highway Star. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I was already in a band, you know, I had a, my own band, but I wasn't, you know, giving much time to it. But I, was, I was standing in front of him and just with my mouth hanging open, you know, a bit like when I went to see Tommy Emmanuel, same kind of feeling. Yeah. Oh, and, uh, I, I just had an epiphany. I thought, I, what the hell am I doing? I, I don't want to be an electronics engineer. I want to be that guy, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just love what his way he was playing and his feel. The same thing yeah. with Rory Gallagher. I, went to, I had a similar feeling with him. So, so I just thought, oh, I saw this. I, got, I grabbed, literally a few days later, grabbed my, I had a Gibson SG at the time and a suitcase, one suitcase with a few T-shirts in it. And I just, <laughs> I just literally ran away from home. Didn't tell anyone I was going. I was just my dad there. He's a long distance truck driver. So I never used to see him anyway. And I got, I ended up in London, but I ended up homeless actually because I rented an apartment and I shared the apartment with some of the musicians in the band I was working, I found. And they said, can we stay with you? We haven't got anywhere to live. I said, yeah, okay. So I went away for a weekend, came back and the, and my apartment had been completely trashed oh, and they'd wow. broken into the gas meter and t- took all my stuff, like my shaver and everything. And uh, the landlady was upstairs screaming, oh, you're going to pay for this. And I, I had no money. So I just like grabbed a few things and ran out. And yeah. I just literally was, I, I was officially homeless. I, I phoned wow. my dad and he said, can I, can I come back, dad? And he said, no, you can't because your stepmother hates you and you can't, sorry, you can't come here. So I had no family, no money, nowhere to live. I was just, and I laid under a bush just trying to, wishing I could die, you know. Wow. You know, I, I should try holding my breath, which is stupid because, because you know, if you hold your, you can't commit suicide holding your breath because as soon as you pass out, you start breathing again, right? So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But anyway, was, I didn't have enough money for drugs. Well, to it, it's a good thing you didn't figure out how to do it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, that's the, that's the kind of the, the, the bottom of the thing, right? Yeah, that, that's in, a good bottom. The bottom of the bottle, as they say. Yeah. Uh, so then I uh, uh, so I got a job in a gas station, and then after a few weeks, so, uh, I was playing like local Irish pubs and stuff. And I was doing night shift, and at 2 o'clock in the morning, this, this band came in and said, oh, you Chris Burkett, the guitarist? And I said, yeah. I said, well, you've been recommended to us by somebody, and um, uh, we're going to Germany for an 18-month tour. And would you like, you know, we need a guitarist. Would you want to come? I said, yeah, yeah, I'd love to. When are we going? He said, 
tomorrow morning. <laughs> so I'm like, oh God, you know, so I had to go back to my apartment when I had to stay, I had to stay at the gas station till 7 a.m. when the boss came in, quit, yeah. put a check for a rent, you know, in my apartment, grabbed whatever I could and got in the back of the van and we went across the English Channel to Germany. And, uh, and that was the beginning for me of my real career because uh, we were the best, turned out to be the best soul band in Germany and the agent asked us to be the backing band for all the Memphis artists that came over to entertain the troops on the NATO bases. That's awesome. So I, was, so I got to play guitar and do a tour, big tour of all of Europe with uh, Rufus Thomas, you know, yeah. the Walking the Dog, Funky Chicken and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. And Peebles, you know, played with her. Uh, King Floyd, Gene Knight, some really great soul acts. So I got my soul chops together. I want you to. I want you to tell the story that I heard. Um, you just named uh, and, and uh, peoples and, and peoples. peoples. I can't stand and, right. Yeah, she had that song, and yeah. you were touring with her, and somebody quite special was in the audience. Yeah, we got. We were asked to play at uh, Bieber's. It was a exclusive, cl- very expensive, exclusive club at the top of a hotel in Kensington, London. They just opened. They wanted a, a band for the opening. So, so Anne Peebles was, at that time she had the she had the big hit. I can't stand the rain. Yeah, so it was a big you know, celebrity artist. People from my generation know that hit from the Commitments, but yeah, Anne oh, Peebles yeah. was the and, original. Yeah, <laughs> I actually do that song quite often on on stage because it's a nice. Oh yeah, that's a, a nice good song. Track. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, Sorry, so, go on. Uh, yeah, so um, I, somebody came up, uh, it was at half, half time or something, somebody came up to me and said, hey, John Lennon's here. <laughs> oh, God, because, you know, being an addicted Beatles fan, you know, sure. it made a big impression on me. So so I was on stage, sort of, I knew that John Lennon was listening to me. Well, I hope, I hope he was anyway. <laughs> but, uh, so did, did but, you meet him? Or, uh... No, unfortunately, I did. Uh, the, the, after the show, there's a lot of, stuff going on you know I yeah, didn't, yeah. I didn't, I didn't, we didn't cross hey that's people. pretty cool that's a cool audience member yeah I can just my claim <laughs> to fame is that I John Lennon was listening to me playing guitar yeah that's pretty cool <laughs> hey there's not a lot of people can say that, <laughs> exactly. so that, that that's pretty cool <laughs> once the tour was over and we had finished all that stuff with the Memphis artists uh, went back to London uh, there, was a, there was a paper called the Melody Maker at the time which is right. really good you could get you could look in the classifieds at the back and get gigs you know and this is like, this is notice name bands looking for a guitar player. So I went to the audition and they asked me to join. It was, it was a band called Love Affair. Right, and right. They'd had a massive hit called Everlasting Love. You probably, yeah. probably, I sure. think you still know that song. Yeah. So I got to tour with them uh, for a few year, couple of years, I think. It's pretty good, you know, it's, it's good vibe because well paid and big audiences, you know. And I've got yeah. a lot of funny stories about that, but I won't go into that right now. But the bass player of that band, uh, one day he said, uh, his name was Dave Guscott, and he said, uh, my friend's just signed a deal with uh, Tony Visconti, and, the, and yeah. they're looking for a guitar player. So I said, oh, yeah, great. It's because I've I great respect for his work, you know, you know, with yeah. Barry and, and Mark Bolan and all that stuff. So uh, so I went to the audition, and they asked me to join. So I got to, um, I find, so, suddenly I was in the... A totally different place, you know. I, I got signed to yeah. a major record company, which is RCA Records via Good Good Earth, which is his company. This is Omaha and, Sheriff, right? Yeah, and, which was uh, a, and we were like a prog we rock band. Well, we were like uh, kind of like Gentle Giant and Yes, the combination yeah, yeah. of those two bands. Uh, and of course, I was listening to those bands a lot. I was really influenced uh, Mahavishnu Orchestra. You know, John wow. McLaughlin, Jean Luc Ponty. In those days, I used to play. So probably like, Genesis really, too with Peter Gabriel. That was yeah. Was, well, funny enough, yeah, uh, I wasn't a big fan of Genesis. I, <laughs> I, preferred, I preferred Yes and Gentle yeah. Giant because I felt that musically they were way over the. Okay. They're way past anyone else I'd ever heard. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Uh, but you know, I was in those. I was kind of a million notes a second. I was a shredder in those days. You know, I was playing <laughs> for my ego. You know, trying to impress yeah, yeah. people how many with my technique, you know. And if you listen to the Omaha Chef recording, some of them are on uh, YouTube, you'll, you'll hear some like blistering <laughs> some guitar work on that. Cool. And, I, and I, you know, it, it wasn't until years later that I actually decided to play the right thing, you know, the right thing for the track rather than, you know, yeah. trying to impress people, you know, type of hey, thing. So, you were young. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, I, exactly. I was only 24 and I signed you're, that. Kid, you're so. supposed to do that at that age. But if anyway, you can, if you can, you know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I, I spent hours and hours practicing, you know, as yeah. you do. Uh, but and uh, and then, but then I, because uh, I was working with Tony, he was 
I was just totally blown away by his engineering skills and the way he got sounds. And I was constantly asking questions because we did two albums together and uh, uh, he became my mentor. Probably, he said, he said once, uh, I probably irritated him a lot, but he said once on a press interview, oh, Chris Burkett, yeah. I, um, I taught him everything he knows, but not everything I know. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Got to hold back some secrets. Yeah, I'm, I'm in his book, too. He, he wrote a uh, biography. So. Uh, so anyway, I learned. I got addicted to record making from him. And then, and yeah. then I started working at a studio called Tapestry, and I got to work with some really great musicians at the time. Uh, and um, That's where you met uh, John Congress, right? John Congress was the owner of that studio. Yeah. In fact, I, me, and, uh, me and the band, Omaha Sheriff, were living in Devon. Okay. In the West Country. Uh, for some reason, one of the guy's father had a, an old cottage made of thatch, with a thatched roof and made of cob, you know, mud and stuff. It's, but it was a cheap place to live and rehearse. So we, we all moved down there. Huh. So, but I ended up, once the deal fell through, as they do, yeah. I ended up milking cows for a living. <laughs> and and, uh, and uh, I was... I was, I was I was milking cows, I was starting at five o'clock, milking 150 cows and, uh, and then doing other things, you know, like digging our holes for gateposts and stuff. In the evening, I was playing at a holiday camp, uh, all covers, but at Westwood Ho holiday camp. So I had to, I had to learn how to read music because people like Los Trios Paraguayos would come in and throw all this fly shit at us, you know, these, these um, you know, scores. Right. And I was like, there's a photo of me like on stage sweating with fear because I was t trying to read, you know, but I had to learn to read music at that time. And then in, after that, after the show, I'd go to a recording studio that a friend had and I'd be recording demos of my songs. So okay. I'd get back home like three or four in the morning and I'd be up at five before five to milk the cows. And I was once I got so, so tired, my, you know, that time, you know, the thing when your body shuts down, but you you know, you don't, your mind's still going. It happened to me in Germany once on a, when we were touring. I, I, I was so exhausted because I was driving the truck all the time. I, uh, I, I fell asleep, but my eyes and my brain were awake. I couldn't move my body. So a sim similar thing happened in, um, in Devon. I, I was digging this huge hole for this gate post. And the next thing I remember, I was down in the hole. My feet were sticking up. I'd just fallen in and fallen asleep. So... <laughs> <laughs> So I, I thought enough enough of this. I'm, I'm supposed to be a musician, you know, not a gatepost digger. So yeah. I phoned up uh, John Congress because because I made friends with him with the first album with Tony. We recorded it at Tapestry Studios before right. Tony had his own studio. So <clears throat> um, John said, "I said, can, John, can you get me any guitar sessions? I've got to get back to London. I'm tired of living in the country." And he said, uh, well, I can get you a few, but maybe not enough to pay the high rents here in London. He said, but I know that you've got an electronics degree and I've just bought, a, I've just bought all this equipment for a new studio. You know, I got a fair light computer, Trident yeah, desk. All yeah. the, he had lots of money. He was, he was an inherited wealth type, right? Uh, so he says, so if you come and build my studio and design it, I'll give you a place. You can stay in one of my rooms at the, at the house until you get your own place. And so I thought, that's, cool. uh, that was great. I mean, if I hadn't been yeah, to my own to be, I might that have been like, digging uh, holes for posts, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I yeah. think it's, uh, it's, uh, <laughs> it's kind of, um, it's interesting because you some things you do in your life, you don't think there's any point in, point in it. Yeah. Actually, they, to, come in, yeah. they can come in really useful. In fact, I've built and designed six recording studios yeah. up to now. And uh, because I, cause I can, you know, I've got the knowledge to sure. do the wiring and design things and fix things so yeah so number had, seven's in new market so yeah, that, yeah so that, that's the seventh one <laughs> yeah Sorry. excellent yeah the, the sixth one was in hawaii uh ah. yeah it was the fifth one yeah i built a studio in hawaii before i came here that's cool but, uh, but i couldn't stay there it's too boring so, so but, before uh, we get on uh because i want you to continue on with uh john congas because there's some really cool stories there with regards to technology yeah uh i just want to back up just slightly because i did hear a story when you were playing with uh, love affair uh that you uh had uh, for there was a little stint uh that you were hanging out with led zeppelin and you oh yeah that's right jam with them and you got to talk with probably one of the best drummers in the world john bonham on 
how he recorded drums. So <clears throat> yeah. share some of that because that's that's just legendary talk. Yeah, yeah, that was uh, <clears throat> that was a very unusual situation. Like we when I, it was while I was in Love Affair, and we were earning so much money that the for tax reasons we had to leave be out of the country for three months a year. <laughs> so so our agent said, well, you've got to be carry on working, you know. So he sent us to an island called Guernsey, which is a tax exile island. It's, okay. like, it's like Monaco and Luxembourg and, you know, there's places in the world where you came in islands where you don't have to, you know, pay yeah. tax. And, uh, and it's, uh, so we, he booked us, he said, you can't, you can't be doing nothing. He booked us in his big club in, in, the, in, the, in Guernsey. And I uh, can't remember the name of this capital now, but anyway, so uh, it was a massive nightclub. Uh, so we were, we had three months residency there, playing every night. You know, can you imagine playing everlasting night every night for three months? <laughs> everlasting love, you know. So, so I think it's the second or third night. I was up there on stage, you know, playing this pop stuff, and I looked down if right in front of the stage there was a huge table, and it was racked with with champagne and every imaginable kind of drink. And uh, I said, "Wow, these these people are really partying." And I, I looked, I thought. That looks like Robert Plant. No, it can't be. And that looks like Jimmy Page. And as I, I was getting really excited. You know, so I came, when we came off stage, I went over to the table. And, and of course, it was Led Zepp. And I said, wow. what, are you, what are you guys doing in this club? And they said, we have to stay away for three months. For that. So they had to shelter a little bit more money than Love Affair did. But yeah. Exactly, yeah. They, 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 didn't have to, they weren't stuck to playing a nightclub. They just... It was just chilling out for three months. Huh? That's awesome. So, so, but they said, we're really bored. And, you know, would you mind if we come up and jam with you while we're here? I said, oh, I said no, man. not at all. <laughs> Are you serious? But, yeah. So, oh, so I got to wow. j- jam with, like, I, I was, they, sometimes they're playing on their own, but sometimes they, they came in with us. And it was, uh, it was really good. I, was just lo- I just loved Bonham's playing, you know. So you actually played with Bonham? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah I, was, I did a, yeah, it's a, uh, they had a they had a keyboard player with them too. I can't remember who it was now, but it was but it was uh, anyway. There's a funny story about that, which I'm not sure whether I've ever told anybody. So, well, go for it. Uh, <laughs> I went to the uh, I went to the washroom once, and John was in there taking a the slash, you know. And uh, this paparazzi guy that they found out that Led Zepp were in Guernsey, and they sent some some newspaper guy over, right? He he went into the washroom with his camera, was taking pictures and it really and really pissed john off a lot so yeah i met all i can remember is john, john grabbed the guy by the ankles and he, t- he t- held him upside down and all i can remember is all this change jingling out rattling on the floor you know from his pockets and he said don't take effing pictures of me <laughs> oh it's wow. used a few other words too but yeah <laughs> it's okay <laughs> it's a c word he used okay <laughs> nice <laughs> and, uh, uh, and that, that was i just thought that was hilarious you know <laughs> that's, that's great <laughs> <laughs> That's, I, I'm glad I uh, brought that one up. I, I, I did not hear that. Yeah, it's part. kind of a rude story, but you know. yeah, yeah. And what tips did he share with you about uh, miking his drums? Oh, yeah, well, I got to talk. I was, you know, on and off. We ch- got to chat together, and uh, I said, "How do you get that wicked drum sound?" I said, you, "What kind of mics do you use?" He goes, "I hate mics." I said, "Well, well, well how did you get this? How do they record you?" And he said. I only, I only let them have one mic in the room, and that's all I want. I don't want mics all around my drums. Yeah. So they used to use a really good, I think it was a, val, a valve uh, Neumann 57, uh, and they used to put it in the room, in a in a really nice room, like a, a slate room or something with a really great, you know, natural reverb. Right. And then, well, if you place just one mic in the right place, you can actually. It's amazing what you can get, uh, what, <laughs> what you can capture, and, and the fact that it's mono. Everything that's going through one diaphragm, you get a lot more power than multi diaphragm recording. You know, if, I don't know if you know this, but when you, uh, this is an engineering thing, if, the more mics you use, the further away the sound goes. And the reason that is, is for, because it's called, it's a thing called phasing. Mm-hmm. So, so music is a sine wave, right? Right. So let's just take it down to the basic sine waves. So you've got a sine wave coming out of one mic and a sine wave coming out of another. But if the other mic's in a different place, yeah, that sine wave the is in a different way. Place. So there are points actually where they actually cancel each other out. Mm-hmm. So that, so that, so the reason Bonham's sound was so punchy and powerful, apart from the fact that he played it that way as well, yeah, yeah. it was because of that, that mono recording. And in fact, uh, talking about phasing, I could tell you a little thing, which I learned from Tony Visconti. Uh, <clears throat> David Bowie used to ha- uh, hate headphones. He wouldn't sing with headphones on. So 
So what Tony did is put two aura tones, these little speakers, in the, in the vocal booth, uh, me measured it exactly on two stands, and then measured it at an equilateral perfect triangle from the mic capsule to the two speakers. And then he put one of them out of phase. So if you're just listening, it just sounds like you can hear the, the speakers, and the, you know. But when the, when the two speakers get to the mic, they cancel each other. You don't hear anything. And that's how he, that's how he recorded Howie's vocals. Pretty cool, Oh, right? wow. So he could hear it, but the, the microphone wouldn't pick it up. Yeah, the microphone, it was invisible to the mic because it was out yeah. of 100 degrees, 180 degrees out of phase. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The sine waves were on oh, wow. reverse, canceling each other. But he could hear it perfectly with his ears, so he could just do whatever he wanted, and none of the playback got into the microphone. Wow, that's a great story. It's a good tip if, if you got because some people can't really perform properly with headphones on. Huh. They, you know, I mean, I can because I've been doing it so long, so it doesn't make any difference to me. But I, I do know artists that kind of freeze up or just don't like the fact that they're hearing their voice coming through. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Not hearing it naturally. I mean, quite, when I'm doing backing vocals, I quite often would take off one head, headphone. Right. Because yeah. you can you can pitch much better when you're yeah. hearing. A, you see like folk singers with a finger in the ear, you know. Yeah, and that's the yeah. same thing. You're getting a direct vibration from the throat to your ear, so it's it's easier to pitch. So well, sometimes too, if it if it if it's a little too loud, uh, wearing headphones, a singer will tend to hold back, right? Because they're trying yeah, to, yeah. they're trying to gauge the the, the volume. <clears throat> It's critical, themselves. actually. Yeah, which screws yeah, it up. It's, I've learned that a lot through years and years of uh, recording, that uh, it's, it's critical. You can destroy a performance if you don't give the person the right feeling in the, in the headphones. So yeah. when I do headphone mixes for the, for the a singer or anybody, after, in fact, I always listen to exactly what they're hearing. I put, I put my headphones in the control room into the same okay. spot, and I listen, and, and I imagine what it must feel, you know, what they must be feeling when they when they're playing so it's uh oh. but you know uh, like i work a lot at uh, revolution well i used to before the lockdown but they have a really nice um system there they you can actually do your own every musician can do his own mix it's a uh, it's a little mixer right and right uh, if it's fed from buses on the desk yeah yeah, yeah. channel and, it, and they can it's usually summed up so there's a drum all the drums are on one fader the bass is on uh, the guitar yeah yeah, yeah most and they can, yeah. that's a really good idea because they can get really comfortable with their own, own mix instead of relying on an engineer. Sure, sure, for sure. Yeah. So let's, let's go back to uh, John Congas. I found this on the uh, internet. <laughs> uh, John's rec John had a recording, uh, uh, a song called uh, He's Going to Step on You Again. Yeah. And uh, the Guinness World Book of Records uh, has uh, labeled it the very first song to use samples. That's right. And yeah, and then that's kind of where you kind of were part of something pretty big yeah. with well, actually, Fairlight and Mutt Lang and go yeah, for I did, it. Yeah, well, actually, okay, well, that's the, the Def Leppard story, I'll tell you yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but in fact, He's Gonna Step On You wasn't actually, it wasn't a sampler because they didn't exist in those days. Okay. Uh, the first sampler that ever came out was a uh, Fairlight. Right. That was late. That was after we did that. That record was done, right? So uh, the way that record was done was uh, there was a we recorded a Brundy drum loop from Africa onto a quarter inch reel to reel tape, mm -hmm. and then what we did, we made a loop, literally a loop. That's where the word loop comes from. So we took the uh, you play the music, you play the thing, and then you you stop the tape and you hear where the downbeat is, right? Mm -hmm. Right, so then you mark that with a white China graph pencil. And then you go one back and then you play it, and then you, pl then you play it eight bars later, or ever, however long the loop has to be. Mm -hmm. You do the same thing. You stop it and rock it around on the thing till you get exactly where the beats, you can hear it. It goes <laughs> like this, right? Yeah, yeah. Mark that with a China graph. Then you cut that piece of tape out. And it, this tape, uh, he's going to step on you, was kind of the size, almost the size of this room. It was, it was a huge loop, right? Yeah. So, so what you have to do is... Uh, you put the you join you get masking tape. You join the tape together so it's one big loop. Right. Put it on. You put it into the machine so the, the tape head, the uh, pinch roller is gripping it. And then we had to put we had to duct tape pencils all around the room. With the as guides, as guides for the yeah, tape. That's it because because the tape had to. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> but that was like revolutionary at the time. Nobody had ever done that. You know. Yeah, that's pretty but, cool. But moving on to the Fairlight. Uh, John, John was, as I said, he was an inherited wealth 
person. His, his mother owned a whole chain of hotels in South Africa, so he never had to really worry about money, you know. Yeah. So when the Fairlight came out, him and Pete Townsend were the only people that could afford to buy it. Huh. It was a, it was a sixty thousand pound machine that was in the eighties. That's that's a lot of, yeah. you know, that's a lot of money, and uh, <clears throat> the average studio could not afford it. So I, I had to learn how to work it, and it was it was really horrible it wasn't this is before the days of midi so if you wanted to play uh you could play a sound into it and it would store it on a floppy disk if you wanted to play that sound you had to give it a name and a location and how the duration of how long it played it's all in what was called music composition language mcl okay so it's like it's just like html so just to get a kick drum there's a whole stream of stuff you had to type just to get a kick drum to play on Four four, the simple rhythm like that. Yeah. So anyway, Mutt Langer heard I was working with him on something else, and he heard about this, the fact that we had the Fairlight. So he he thought, well, I want I want to do something nobody's ever done. I want to use digital drums on the Pyromania album. <laughs> uh, the drummer was still playing. It's before he lost his arm, but yeah, Rick so, Allen. What, so yeah, so what he did, the drummer gave me a tape of him playing from the rehearsal. You know, when they're rehearsing songs. Okay. Uh, and uh, I had to score. Luckily, I could read music and write music at that time. Yeah. I had to score all the everything you played on on the score. You know, like yeah, the hi hat was good in the sixteens. You have to go, do, 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 you know, write it all out, right? And the only reason I had to do that because every instrument had to be written individually with a code wow. to get it to play. And and, you, and it's monophonic, so you can only play one thing at a time. So we're using the SMPTE code, SMPTE code, to synchronize it. So literally, we'd sit. I sit there with Mark for. He was he was fanatic about timing. So we'd be like there sometimes for a whole day listening to a hi hat against the click that I programmed in. And he's like, "Well, it's a little bit early. It's a bit late. Can we just move the code?" And it's all this all time. It's just really mathematical and horrible. So we spent six weeks doing the drums like that. Wow. And then and then he and it's all stored on these big floppy disks, right? And. Uh, <clears throat> He went away and was working on another studio on guitars and voices and stuff. He calls me up about about nine months later and says, Chris, we've got to do the drums again. Said, oh, no, what? It was, and luckily, I saved everything. I had everything saved. You know, so I had yeah. the sound and the code already done. He said, well, I've gone through four 24-track tapes and they've worn out. I've been co- bounce, bouncing from one to another, copying. And he said, I want first first-generation drums. So... You know, because wow. if you copy the drum tracks four times, they start to get get weaker and weaker. It's analog yeah, recording; yeah, it's not yeah. like digital. You know, uh, so wow. so that's what, so we had to spend a you know almost equal amount of time. I said I didn't have to program it again, but the same the same painful like process. I mean, it gets good results, but I can't personally work like that. I <clears throat> I am um, I'm very much a feel feel guy. I mean, uh, nothing compares to you, for example, was a was a one take vocal. Sinead came in and did yeah. it, and they did a double track, and then went home. She hated studio, so, so and I, I, I found some of the. Uh, I did a big hit record for Alison Moyet called yeah, "That Old." Yeah. This is a jazz classic called "That Old Devil Called Love," and uh, that was the same thing. That record took one and a quarter days to make. She, she came in, did a one take vocal. We had a jazz quartet, put it straight down, mixed it the next morning in four hours, and that was a number one record in, wow. in the UK for about eleven weeks. So some of the best, some of the biggest records I've ever done have been done really quick. Really quick, yeah. yeah. Well, Mutt Lang is, but he's he's legendary for taking forever. I think the the, yeah. the album after Pyromania, that that's the one that yeah. you were talking about. I think Hysteria. I, I think I, I saw in a documentary they spent like three years making that. I mean, yeah. he had the accident. Uh, Rick Allen had the accident before Hysteria, so yeah, yeah. They, had, they had a little extra work to do. But uh, wow, what a story, eh? Because. Uh, I'm just thinking out loud here. So the pyromania, uh, he he played the drums, but you transcribed the drums. He, is. he, he told me what he wanted. Yeah. So like you transcribed it, programmed it, and then shortly after that, he loses his arm. You know. So do you feel yeah. guilty? Do you feel guilty? No, I'm just. I'm fault. joking. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, could feel guilty. I could feel a bit guilty if you like. <laughs> Wow, but that, that's an amazing story. I mean, uh, that album kind of kicked off their career. And- well, it's the kind of story of my life, you know, because I didn't really get credited. They, they, couldn't, yeah. they didn't want to credit me as drum programming because 
because the fans wouldn't have liked it, you know. No, um, yeah, it, I had no so, idea. So I was just credited as like, you know, I don't know, assistant engineer or something. It's just, uh, it's yeah, irritating. Yeah. It happened to me a lot. And I, I used to, I, for years I got, I got, I uh, wasn't getting credit for my work. You know, if you're an engineer, I was a musical engineer. So I would help people a lot with their arrangements and everything. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, and I was also writing my own songs at the time. You know, I, I put out a record called Aphrodisiac and it was a number one club hit for about a year in England. It's just, in fact, it became an international hit. I, you, know, you, could, you can get it on, uh, on YouTube. Sure. Aphrodisiac, yeah. three, three words. And uh, uh, Soul to Soul, uh, the manager of Soul to Soul phoned me up because he'd heard this record. And he said, oh, we, we like the, what you did there. It's all, it's all samples. I was using samples from Africa. Okay. Wow. My own samples because I'd worked a lot, been recording a lot in Africa. Okay. And, uh, <clears throat> He said, "We'd like Soul to Soul would like you to work on their new record." And I, so at the time, I'd I'd been like, you know, not getting proper credit for any anything I was doing hardly. And uh, I said, well, "Yeah, great, okay, I'd, I'd love to work with Soul to Soul." You know, back to life, back to yeah, yeah. Reality. Okay, said, that's the one. Yeah, yeah, and gotcha. I, and I said, yeah, that was a big hit. Yeah, so it's, this was after that hit. So they were okay. like, they were doing putting the next album together. Yeah. I said, "Yeah, send me a send me a producer contract, and you know we'll." You know, I saw it out and he says, oh, no, they don't want you uh, credited as producer. They just want you to work on it, program it and engineer it. And I, I said, no, oh, no, thanks. I'm not doing that anymore. Yeah, I, you learn. I started turning stuff down because I was doing a ton of creative work and working like 48-hour sessions sometimes yeah. and not getting – just getting a fee for it. Not right, getting, right. I, didn't, I, I mean, I'm not, it's never been about money for me, uh, you know, it's, but, it, but I'd like to be credited and respected for what I do. yeah. Know? Yeah, well, so at least you did for Sinead O'Connor, that, that song. Yeah, well, in a way, but I still didn't get my proper credit on that record oh. because I got I got a contract, a producer contract, and I got paid producer royalty. You know, I made probably upwards of $5 million in royalties on that record, right? which you did, right. in, you could in those days. Yeah. But, yeah. but uh, the record was started by uh, Nelly Hooper, and he only worked on the album for like two days, and Sinead couldn't stand, stand it. She walked out. So the company phoned me and said, Chris, we haven't got a producer. Can you can you take over? And that's that's how right. I got the key. But oh, he'd already been he'd already been like credited as everything. So so I didn't you know, I just got credited as mixer and engineer, but I, I you know, co produced the record. Right, with, right. Hey. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And I got the, I got a contract to prove it, you know. So what I read here too, uh you can correct me if I'm wrong, but on the Pyromania album, there was somebody else who didn't who had to hide his name uh that you later worked for was uh, Thomas Dolby. He played keyboards right. on it. But he couldn't use his name for some legal reasons. So. Oh, yeah, that's weird, yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, I got to work with Thomas Dolby after that. Yeah, we did an album called uh, Golden Age of Wireless. Yeah, that's the big uh, Blinding Me With Science was on there, right? Yeah, well, well, no, it wasn't Blinding Me With Science. That was, that was after that album. But or Hyperactive, uh, commercial, Hyperactive, maybe? Commercial Breakup and all that. There's some really great tracks on it. Yeah, yeah. But... Uh, I got some funny Thomas Dolby stories. If you've got the time, yeah, I got time for a story. Well, one, one, <laughs> one, it's one I've never told. We were working really late because Thomas Dolby was a night bird. We used to okay. start sessions at like nine in the evening, just work all through the night, you know. And uh, so we were down at Tapestry Studio, and Tapestry Studio was a basement studio, okay. and we had an interphone camera on the up in the street to you know for security. Okay, so people would ring, and then we'd look at the camera. And so anyway, we. One night we're working away and the, and the bell goes and we just, I just opened it, I pushed the button, I was busy, I was doing something. So I, I just assumed it was one of the band was coming back from the pub or something, right? And this guy came down the stairs, he's blind drunk, this huge guy the size of a house. And he, he staggered down the stairs and he came in and he goes, oh, what's this? Oh, it's a recording studio. Oh, what are you doing then? Let me hear it. You know, so, Thomas was like sitting at the desk all serious. We're not going to play you anything. Now go away. You know? <laughs> and the guy's, no, come on, mate. I want to hear what you started to get aggressive. And I, I, oh, wow. I was like in charge. Of, I was running the place, right, as well. You know, I was a house yeah, engineer. Yeah. So I had to do something. And, I, and uh, I'm not an aggressive person at all. You know, I, I'm just kind of, I'm a lover, not a fighter. You know, kind yeah, of right, right. And, uh, and, uh, but I, I had to get this kind of, I had to kick into my animal nature. And I, I went around to the other side of the desk where the guy was standing. And I, I said, get out of here, you, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so like, like a, you know, like 
like a bear type of thing, you know. Yeah. Like, I was only half his size, so I thought he was going to kill me. <laughs> and, it, and the bluff paid off. He said, oh, sorry, mate. And just, it just went off. And I, oh, there I went you go. And made sure he got out. So it's funny because Tom, Tom was all like, we're not going to play you anything. <laughs> it's all like, cool. <laughs> it's very <laughs> serious. Like this. <laughs> very British. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, he's, yeah, he's a, he's a genius, really. I, I, I really like his... Um, well, that was cutting edge stuff. I remember that, like, you know, like you got in your youth, you get like standout songs. Like, you know, I wasn't a Thomas Dolby fan or, you know, but, but that song just kind of sticks out. Like if I hear that yeah. one of his songs now, it just brings me back to that time. Yeah. You know? yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't an, a really important song to me when it happened, but it was such a big song that it yeah. just, you know, it just sticks yeah, yeah. out, well, that, you know. Yeah, that was just, that was kind of the thing that broke him out to the And his videos, public. you know, the videos but, yeah. were, the videos were kind of like. But, but his first single, actually, he was, he was signed to A&R Records. This friend of mine, I can't remember his name now, but he signed Sting and all those people. Yeah. Uh, but uh, his first single was called Urges. And it was, you should check it out. You can get. Okay. It's, it's still on YouTube. Urges by Thomas Dolby. It's really at that time, it's just revolutionary. It's really yeah, good. yeah, it's kind of and, uh, and the commercial breakup song I told you about, which is off the Golden Age of Wireless, that's all over the on YouTube. The keyboard solo is all over YouTube because it's such a great synth solo he did on it. Yeah, yeah. Because people have studied it for years, and you know, <laughs> shows how. Yeah, how people, it. people don't know that he he's been on a lot of people's records. Like, yeah, outside yeah, of his own. yeah. I got yeah. a lot of respect for Tom. So it's, uh, yeah. But, but I, I ripped a hole in this, one of his songs once in the middle of a tape, so that's, that's the other story I was going to tell you. But, uh, oh, go for it. Well, it was, it, they went out for, uh, for dinner, you know, and uh, about 11 o'clock at night, and uh, I, was, I thought I, bet I should clean the tape heads, you know, because it's analog tape, and you, it's good to okay. keep them really clean, get yeah, the, yeah. the oxide off. And I was spinning off the tape, and, and I, you, you're, supposed to, you're, never, you're not supposed to take the tape head guard. It's a big metal square. It's a guard, magnetic guard. You're not supposed to touch that while the tape's going. But I used to quite often because you whip it off. And then, uh, anyway, I took it off and it just, unluckily, it caught. I caught this tape while it was going really fast and ripped a huge V-shaped rib about oh, two shit. feet long in the mid, right in the middle of a song. Oh, God. I thought, oh no, because Tom, Tom was not not the he was a serious character, you know. He wasn't like, yeah. oh, it's all right, mate. It, it, was, it would be a lot of trouble, you know. And uh, so I thought, well, what am I going to do? So, so I I got this like iron and I was, you know, trying to straighten it, straighten the tape out. It was all wrink, crinkled, you know. Oh, and then I put this big, massive masking tape uh, V-shaped join in it, and uh, you know, taped it all down, and then just wound it back off, and 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 it never got noticed. Wow, that's incredible. It's amazing. Nobody ever noticed it. I was, every time it, we were mixing, I was, it would go past this bit. I'd like distract somebody and sort of look at that <laughs> spider on the wall over there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. I think it's, I think it's in the middle of uh, a song called Through the Airwaves Ballad on the album. <laughs> I'm going to check that out. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's inaudible, luckily, because the tape's going at 30 inches a second, right? Okay. So a two inch, a two foot. Um, thing you know rip goes past yeah. quite quick you know right yeah yeah so, yeah exactly. so you don't really you, you, we couldn't hear it you know so you must really shake your head when like younger people in the business complain about how complicated like pro tools is oh, <laughs> you must just oh, like oh, oh, come on guy you have no clue oh, what we used to do <laughs> pro tools is a dream so i just yeah, love yeah, it yeah. Uh, but you know i've been into midi and stuff for you know, probably one of the first people to get into media, obviously. But yeah, uh, I'll give you an example. I, I did a couple of records with uh, Mel Brooks, you know, the filmmaker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've heard this story. And, uh, it's a good one. Yeah. I did a I did a song, quite a successful song called The Hitler Rap. And yeah, this was off like movie. History of the World or something, right? That's it, yeah, that's it. Two, <laughs> two records, I think. One, one was called To Be or Not To Be. That's not the, very politically correct in today's world. but You couldn't do that now. <laughs> you, seen, you couldn't do that now. If you, if you see the video, it's kind of a really sexy video. <laughs> but, but it's, it's, it's uh, totally, uh, you know, it's anti. hilarious. It's just sending up the, 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 the whole war thing, you know. Yes. And, <laughs> but but uh, Mel couldn't. He had no idea. He couldn't rap. In, it's a rap record, and he couldn't rap in time. He's he's a filmmaker. He's not you know a musician. So so in the end, I gave up. I couldn't get him to. It, uh, Pete Wingfield put the music together. Um, so it's this big funky kind of 
80s disco thing, you know. Yeah. It's uh, still out there on YouTube. And uh, uh, But Mel couldn't get in time. So in the end, I gave up and I just said, so just, look, Mel, just, just read the words. You know, you know the song, you know the song, right? Well, hi there, people. You know me. I used to run a little joint called Germany. I was number one, the people's choice, and everybody listened to my mighty voice. My name is Adolf. I'm on the mic. I'm going to hit you to the story of the new Third Reich. Well, it all began down in Munich town. You know, it's a big sort of like stream. You of remember work. the words? <laughs> yeah, okay, well, I've written it for ages. <laughs> oh, because you spent like hours and hours cutting this thing up. <laughs> I said to Martin Gordy, hey, 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 Marty, why don't we start a little na- a Nazi party? So we had an election, well, kind of, sort of, before you knew it. Hello, new order. You know, there's like some really funny lines in it. Yeah, yeah. But, but none of that was in time. So what I did, I put him on quarter-inch tape, and then I did the old rock and roll thing with a China graph pencil getting on the beat. Yeah. And then you put the tape in pause, and you just go, one, two, three, four, bang, right? Just to hit, hit it, the beat before you want it to come in. And which is pretty accurate, but if it's if it comes in early, then you have to get a new a new mark on the tape. Yeah, yeah. So I, and then and then I had to I had to do that in one hand and drop in the twenty four track master on the other. It, for the, it's it's really complicated. Yeah. And it, it just took for, forever. If you make a mistake because it's analog, it's not like Pro Tools. But Pro Tools is all non destructive. You can just yeah, yeah. drag out your audio. And it's, it's it's a dream, right? So basically, when you're doing what we call like nudging, you're yeah, we're just yeah. nudging it back and forth to be on the beat. Yeah, but it's a word by word. It's just took forever. Wow. You know? you, you can't, you can't do it on the record. But, um, but the good the good side to this story is I was playing, when I was living in France, I was playing with a Berber artist called Ali Amran. I did a, produced a couple of albums, this music from North Africa, and he's very popular in France. So we were playing in a place called Lyon, and a big, big crowd. He used to get, you know, thousands of people. I was playing guitar for him. So I come off stage one night and this, this big guy comes up to me and goes, in his German accent, he said, are you Chris Burkett, the, the, the man who made, made the Mel Brooks record? And I thought, <laughs> he's going to kill me, you know. And I said, uh, yeah, yeah, that was, was me. And, uh, and he flung his arms around me and hugged me. And he said, I want to thank you. He said, this record was the first time us young Germans could laugh about the war. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> you don't know what to do with that. That's pretty, it's, it's pretty cool. Right? Yeah, it just shows <laughs> the healing yeah. power of music, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because Mel had sent, it made it, it made it funny, you know? And, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And they, you know, because, I, I don't know. Just, he had another crazy uh, movie, too. I can't remember what it was, but it, it was Oh, yeah, it's called, it's called, uh, it's called, to, um, uh, it's good to be the king. It's about yeah. King Louis. It's, it's to do with the French Revolution. It's yeah, yeah, we, yeah. We made yeah. a record about that too. It's really <laughs> oh, funny. <did> you? <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Well, and um, further on on your skills, uh, this is cool. I want you to share this, and I know you shared it before, but this is my show, yeah. <laughs> so I want you to share the. Show. So uh, you did uh, many years. You work with Buffy Saint Marie. Yeah, and yeah. there's a killer story because. COVID, so many of us have been doing this for the very first time. We're all kind of recording at home and we're sending mm. each other, you know, files and we're all yeah. building tracks in our DAWs. But mm. way before the internet, you did this with, with Buffy St. Marie sharing uh, MIDI files over CompuServe. And I remember, remember that. that. I, I, I used that in my last year at university or tried to. It didn't work very well. Well, CompuServe is uh, pre well, World Wide Web, right? So yeah, yeah. It, uh, it was the first, one of the first servers, but uh, it was a very limited bandwidth. We only had well, one, one megabyte or something you know, <laughs> bandwidth, right? Yeah. Uh, so, so it's big enough to send MIDI files because they're like so many kilobytes. Um, so we, I met Buffy in London. Uh, she signed, she signed to Nigel Grange's label, um, Ensign Records, via Chrysalis, and. Uh, Nigel phoned, Nigel phoned me out one day. He goes, guess what, Chris? I said, what? He said, I've just signed a legend. And I said, who's, well, who's that? He said, I want you to produce it. And I, I said, who's, who, who is it? And he said, Buffy St. Marie. And I, I said, who's that? <laughs> <laughs> that was because I was in London and made, I was buried yeah, in yeah. the studio. So I, I didn't know what was going on, you know. I was just making records all the time. And uh, so I got to meet Buffy and we got on really well. And she said, I don't like flying all the time. It's just really tiring. And I live in Hawaii and it's 12 hours. Yeah, time it's a long zone, you know? So she said, can we, there must be a way we can get started without, you know, can we come in over here? And 
So she was luckily she's going out with a techie guy called Roger Jacobs at the time. He's a, he's now running an internet company in Hawaii. He's really smart. Oh, so, wow. so anyway, Roger uh, spoke to Roger and he he said, "Well, we can do. Uh, comp- they've got this new company called Compuser. We can actually Ruffy can send you her MIDI files." So I set I set up how to do it. On the, it's all done modem and stuff, right? And um, so she sent the whole album, uh, all her keyboard parts, which is she was essentially is all based on keyboards. There wasn't any audio. It's just it's just keyboards. And all I had to do was mirror the same setup in my studio in London. And that, that was it. I, it. It came in and I, I had all the MIDI files, put them into my, uh, I think I was using an Atari at the time. And uh, just record, uh, we used the same sounds. She told me what, she's using Proteus and Roland 550 and all D50s and all that stuff, right? And Yamaha DX7s in those okay. days. And, and uh, so um, she, it, uh, all I had to do is put the, literally record what she sent me onto 24 track two inch tape right and i did some stuff like guitars and percussion because i do a lot of that stuff with buffy and yeah. bass and stuff and uh you know i just took the tapes she buffy didn't have a 24 track machine in hawaii so i took his big flight case full of two inch tapes which are really heavy yeah over to uh steely dan studio in maui walter wow. becker was running it at wow. the bass part. and we did all the vocals and stuff over there so and then to mixed it back wow. in london yeah, so, cool. so the, the album was born on the web, and th- there was a big article in Billboard magazine because we were the first known people to actually do that. That's incredible to to, to think that way back then when nobody's ever done it. Yeah, it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of a. So you yeah. actually had to like import the MIDI information in physically into a keyboard. It came down on the it came down on as a modem kind of uh, series of data, and that I printed that onto a. Uh, a floppy disk okay and uh i, I put it i can't remember i did now i put it into i was using an atari running cubase at the time okay which was at the time was the best midi yeah system and i used to synchronize my atari with the smpta code which is on track 24 of the of the 24 track machine that would drive the an src cat which would drive midi and give us synchronized midi wow. code and I, I did a lot of records like that because it's you it gave you 20 23 tracks of analog yeah. Plus tons of MIDI. Yeah, unlimited wow. tracks of MIDI. So you can, wow. you know, I do a lot of stuff like that. You are so, really ahead of your time, man. Yeah. It's, it's, and so I, I did a lot of records on the Akai, Akai samplers, you know, because that, that was after the Fairlight. After Fairlight and Synclavia, uh, the Japanese got into, into the technology and they started making affordable yeah, technology yeah. For, for sampling, you know. So Aphrodisiac was all done on a S nine S nine fifty at the time, Akai S nine fifty sampler. Wow, that's so incredible! Yeah, yeah. These are well, the, amazing yeah, the, stories. Yeah, the 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 Akai uh, the the Atari was because it was only running it, it wasn't running audio in those days. It wasn't like Pro Tools where you got a, you know digital audio workstations running audio and MIDI. Yeah. It, it had to be synced synced to, to audio tracks. But the actual timing of the MIDI was really accurate. It was a very good system for MIDI. So, oh wow! You know, it's, so let's talk it's about guitars, since this thing is called guitar players. And oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. What's uh, what's, what's your that? go? What's your go-to guitar now? Uh, hmm. Well, I kind of uh, I like lots of guitars. Um, I I used to have a. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry to say this. <laughs> In a nostalgic way, I had a Fender Telecaster 1959. Yeah, yeah, and, uh, great. And uh, I actually sold it way a long time ago yeah. for 600 pounds <laughs> because I needed to get I wanted to get uh, the latest technology in guitars, which was this this one here. Oh, shit. <laughs> this is a. Uh, this is the first MIDI guitar that ever came out. So you sold a 59 Tele for a MIDI yeah, guitar. This is my, this, I got 600 for my Telecaster, and this was 1,500 pounds <laughs> at the time, right? Yeah. And, yeah. I, and I, wanted, I wanted this because I wanted to play guitar into my computer and play like bass lines and keyboard parts, which it does. Wow. It's, it's, a, it's, got, it's got this uh, incredible like, oh, okay. you know, MIDI set socket and everything. Gotcha, I see. It's it. also got yeah. a ton of interior sounds, but I don't use them. I, I use, uh, yeah. you know, right through my keyboard. So uh, I was really sad. After, you know, subsequently I was sad I did that. I should, I've never done that since. I've always uh, kept yeah. my guitars. 
I'm not, I'm not going to sell anything, you know. Yeah, um, yeah. I can't afford to buy a new one. I'll just wait until I can, you know. Yeah, yeah. But, but that guitar was quite um, unusual because because I was a techie guy too. Yeah, yeah. I built a, a circuit under the – I took the, uh, the, front, the front panel off. The, the, the tra, tra, Is it Treffer light or something? It's plastic. The, yeah, the Baker white, light. Baker light, thank you. Yeah. I took or that bake, off. bake light, I think. Yes, yeah, bake, yeah. Yeah, bake light. Yeah, so, so, so I just unscrewed it and I put a circuit inside the guitar and then I did the unspeakable, which is the, the back of the 1959 Stratocaster. I carved a hole for two batteries. Oh, but, but, I, but I put a Baker light panel over it to match the guitar. So it didn't, uh, you, guys didn't call it, you guys call it a scratch guard. Yeah, scratch guard, is it? <laughs> we call it a pick guard. So, but anyway, it was. It gave me a chance to have. It, I put a small switch just below the volume knob, which I could okay. flip with my little finger. And when you did that, you get this incredible sustain would come out of it. You know, it's, it's oh, a boost effectively. It's well, okay. well before anybody had uh, guitar pedals. You know. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and uh, anyway, Jimmy Page loved it. He used to play it. Women in Guernsey. He was, he was playing it all the time. He just loved it because it had given this. You could just oh, go that, so that was the guitar you had with yeah, the, when you, you were playing yeah, with Love playing, Affair. I was playing with Love Affair and all that. Just okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, and uh, Rory Gallagher liked it. He asked me to, to, if I'd do, doctor one of his guitars. Like, yeah, he really yeah. liked, I, I met him in the uh, Olympic Studios. Uh, so anyway, I got rid of that, um, unfortunately. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, uh, I guess, listen, in the late 70s, there was no such thing as vintage, you know, so it's, yeah, it's, it didn't I mean, mean, you know, it didn't really mean much at that point in time. Yeah, I mean, they, those guitars sell for like $20,000 or something now, it's just ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Old, just, you know. uh, I've got this uh, really nice tele, Telecaster here, it's, it's, I like this one, I've got super light strings on it. Oh, okay, the Nashville one with the, with the yeah, same it's got, um, yeah. I put like uh, I think I got uh, eight eights on these. Oh boy! So you get yeah. super. It's good for like super bendy stuff, you know. Yeah, yeah. And I got this um, uh, PRS, which I bought in Hawaii. So this is a pretty guitar. It's a Carlos Santana type thing. Right, right. Yeah, this is this is uh, it's got a beautiful neck. You know, it's got all these little birds carved. Yeah, in yeah, it. yeah. Their yeah, stuff is really good quality. This this uh, this sounds good, but it's quite heavy, so I don't. Yeah. You know, I kind of use my Yamaha on most of my gigs around Toronto. I've got a Godan, which is quite nice. This one here. This has got a really nice sound. So it's the uh, same. The, the reason I got this guitar because I worked with Sting many years ago. I did a tour with him really? uh, doing live sound. Okay. And, uh, he played a song called Fragile. Right, right, sure. And uh, he used this guitar. I just, I thought it just sounded really good on stage. It's just, it just plugs in. You know, you can go straight into uh, an XLR, straight into a console. So you get a really clear sound, and it's, yeah, it yeah. sounds really good. So, so, I'm, so I'm, I kept that guitar. It's really good. And my, my one of my favorite guitars, which I use a lot, is this. I don't even know what this is? Oh, okay, like a lap steel. It's a, it's a Gretsch lap steel. Yeah, yeah. And I've been using this on a lot of records recently. It's uh, oh, nice. it's very expressive. I like, I've always loved playing slide anyway. Yeah, yeah. Have you yeah. been? Have you ever been listening to the uh, to, uh, their sisters, Lark and Poe? No. You ever, yeah. you ever check that stuff out? No, not yet. Lark, so, yeah, Lark, Lark, link, I'll check it. Yeah, Lark and Poe, their sisters. Uh, unbelievable. Through the um, pandemic, they've been posting a lot of covers, but the uh, the one plays uh, lap steel. And the yeah. other, you know, plays like acoustic and the oh, harmonies. Right. But she's an incredible lap steel player. Well, let me write that down. What they call I'll, lap I'll, I'll message it to you. Okay. <laughs> You're going to love it. I'll, right. I'll, send you, I'll send you a few links. <laughs> yeah. yeah that's true. I, I like so you got, you've got a lot of kind of worldly uh, string instruments there behind you. Maybe you show yeah. one, like that 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 f flouty one. <laughs> I don't know what you call it. This one here? Yeah. What, what, what is that called? That's called a wood. Uh, oud, okay. O U D. It's from North Africa. How many strings are on that? It's twelve. It's twelve. But it's it's fretless. Twelve. So it's, uh, okay. uh, in fact, um, uh, the song called um, "Take Me Higher," which we mentioned earlier, which which um, Tristan Avakian played on. He played that. No, he didn't play. He got, he's oh, got he one like it, but he's got an electric wood made by Godan. Oh, really? Company. What's and, the tuning uh, on it like? Uh, it's uh, we well, yeah, it's fretless. You have to, it's like a fretless bass. You have to you have to know what you're doing. <laughs> no, but what are the strings tuned to? Are they like are they uh, on the horse or uh, 
Oh, it's a it's a twelve string. They're just tuned like a guitar. Like I do. Oh, anyway. it's tuned like a guitar. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's like um, a twelve string guitar. You know. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Uh, okay. Um, so it's got, uh, but they But there's no frets. Strings, some of the strings are are together. Some of them in octaves. You know, it's a bit like yeah, a twelve. Yeah, string. yeah. Oh, interesting. It's, okay. It's got, a, it's got a really beautiful sound. And then the one next, oh, well, that's a you could that's a guitar lady. It's a it's a yeah. ukulele, but a six string one. Right. So I, I like that because I'm not very good on ukulele. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, and that's this one's a, uh, a fretted version of that. It's called oh, okay. La, it's called La Ud. It's called a La Ud, and it, and it's from Spain. Okay. Uh, and uh, it has frets. It's twelve. It's twelve strings, but it has frets. So it's like yeah. a mini twelve string guitar. You know, it's quite, right, right. It's a very oh, pretty sound. Interesting. And then, uh, there's a dulcimer there. I don't know if you yeah, can see that's it. That's right. Yeah, yeah. I'll use that a lot, especially for modal music. And then I've got a mandolin up there. Sure, yeah. Uh, and then well, it's, this room's full of guitars. It's, it's stuff that you never couldn't even imagine. There's, I've got a bazooki from Greece. Type. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll have to come in person someday. I, have to, I, could, I could probably show you. Hold on. I just have, cause I'm, <laughs> I'm on Wi-Fi at the moment. So so this is, this is uh, right. I think you can see that. So we have uh, on that wall there. Oh, you got this, some, yeah, some more. A bazooki uh, from Greece. Bazo- yeah. Yeah. And then we got, uh, and then next to it is an Irish bazooki. It's How many practically... strings are on those? I don't uh, know. It's eight strings on bazooki. Eight. Okay. Yeah, they're, they're kind of tuned like a mandolin. Mandolin, yeah, yeah, yeah. But they're giant. Uh, some of them call it a mandola, but that's actually an Irish bazooki. Yeah. Well, it's and we got, a and then we got much six larger string, scale. Six, six string banjo. Let me can see it. There. Yeah, yeah. It's about. So it's, it's, it's kind of interesting too. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, over this, oh, this side we've got <laughs> got some interesting stuff here. Uh, is that big giant? See that massive? Holy long cow! Neck? What is the scale length on that? Oh, it's got be it, maybe fifty inches. It's called a it's called a sans. It's from Persia, and it wow. sounds like a bass banjo. It's a really great sound. You gotta have um, long arms. And it has well, it has a thirty-two note scale. Wow! It's for Eastern music. You know, the in Eastern music they use th- we only use twelve notes in our scale but they use 32 yeah the microtones yeah, yeah. microtones we the only thing the only time we ever use microtones in our culture is uh in the blues where you go in between the minor yeah, and sure. the major. yeah yeah for sure it gives it, gives it a little bit of tension but they use a lot oh. they use a lot more than that so you know that's fascinating you got some really fascinating instruments in there yeah well, great. I, I play them all they're not decorations so they you know i try to i use them on records that i produce for people excellent and, uh, well i really appreciate the the, the stories it's been great to listen to the stuff and i'm glad i get to share it um you mentioned the facebook stuff so i i was kind of going through your page and you kind of take a little next level i, I really appreciated kind of what you were doing um you've been doing it consistently which is yeah. one thing so you've kind of like you, you play some of your own songs and you and you're playing to some tracks so you got like a big production sound yeah. And then you're cutting in videos into the live feed, and then you're taking in live calls, like, and you're doing you're you're doing this all by yourself, right? You don't have an yeah. operator. Yeah, I use it. I could share my uh, secret if you like, because I. I'm yeah, I'm, I'm curious. I was wondering how lot, you pull it off. Well, a lot of, lot of people have been asking me how I get such a great sound online. So I've been actually helping them. People like some of the artists I've worked with, I've actually helped them to set up to get a much better sound. So, yeah. so what I do basically is a, is a, it's a chain of events you need to know about the first thing is you've got to get the good mics right so sure. this is a this is a go-to vocal mic it's also good for lots of other things but this yeah. is a this is a famous mic steve earl sang in this oh, uh, yeah? Schneider, connor buffy st marie you know alison moyer a lot of big stars are sang in this mic so oh excellent it's called an akg 414buls it's uh, it's a really clear mic but you can like you can scream into it it won't distort so it's really it's really good nice um and then i use a uh, for acoustic guitar i use an akg 451e it's one of okay. these things right and that's, i'm just kind of set up for tonight so let's work all this stuff around me oh that's great <clears throat> and uh and then that goes into um i've got this little thing on the top here. it's called a focus right uh two two i two okay it, just it, a small interface yeah yeah i don't i use i don't use that much for i've got the, the claret here which has eight inputs right big, right bigger one yeah but for for the for facebook live it's perfect because what i yeah, do yeah. I, I have a small mixer here which has uh, got eight channels 
And I put that the out, the stereo output of that mixer straight into the focus right on line in. Okay, I guess so you're using one channel, but you're mixing from the mixer. Is that exactly? Yeah. yeah well, yeah. no, it goes no. It's two channels going in left and right. Okay. And then uh, I set it all up so it's, everything's you know. And then the uh, the focus right talks to the computer via sure. USB. Yeah. Uh, and that talks to whatever you can run Pro Tools through it or whatever you want to do, right? Yeah, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. But I use a program which I bought. Uh, it's about 120 20 bucks or so. Um, it's called Ecam. Okay. Ecam Live. Uh, there's, there's there's lots of different programs out there, but I like Ecam. Ecam allows you it selects automatically whatever interface you're using, so the focus light comes up on the list. You know. Yeah. Uh, so so I know it's reading that. It's getting the input from my mixer. Yeah. The mixer's just an ordinary mixer. It's got you know eight channels. So I have a microphone for vocals, a microphone for guitar, an input for my looper. I use a, okay. a, a, a Boss RC50 looper, which right. has some of my grooves in it. Okay. So I've got something to play to. Uh, and then uh, also a stereo input for playback mixes, which I just run off my, my phone. But, but you're doing this all kind of live. you got to like... Uh... Yeah, I know, I do. I've pre- preset it up. It's like today I spent about an hour setting up tonight's show. So yeah. you go scene one, you just go hit the little plus button, you go scene one, you just, yeah. I just say intro, right? And, and you can... You can write on the screen. There's a little, there's a little text button. You hit it, and you can start write whatever you like on the screen and expand it. And then you can also draw, drag any photo off your desktop onto the screen. Yeah, yeah. Size, size oh, nice. It. That's so, very professional. It's, uh... Yeah, and then, and then if you're going to put, if you're going to put, that's, that's to do the the, 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 the show like live like this. Yeah. Uh, if you want a video on, what you do is you just go. It just when you create the scene, you you just it says source and you go source video you go to the video on your hard drive just click on it just open it and it drags the video in, into the program yeah and then you just have to you can do whatever you like you can write on top of the video if you want to say what it is yeah, or yeah. i just normally just play it and then you go to scene three and that could be another live thing just me playing yeah, yeah. scene four could be a phone in so it's just a live screen and somebody calls me up and i just literally put the phone near the I, they call me up and I just put my phone on speaker and put it right near the mic. Oh, really okay, clear. okay. So yeah, it's kind of, that part's yeah. low tech. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, it's low tech. But it's, <laughs> but, you know, phone, phone Good calls. For you. They Good sound for you. Like no, I, and you know, kudos to you for doing it so so regular. You know. Um, yeah, it's a theme every week. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah it's, right, last week impressive. was mental health because it's mental health month, and yeah. uh, the week before that was angels, and they've got lots of people on that. Two people love stuff Excellent. about angels. Good so. stuff. That's um you know before we say goodbye, I want you to just to touch on a few stuff that's going on. Um, uh, you got a project um, with uh, Sherry Talon called Free Spirits. Yeah, and uh, I know you had your 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 record release party at Say What, but just a week before the world shut down. Yeah. So yeah, you know, maybe you could just just update us on where that are you going to try to pick up where you left off or uh, yeah, what's start. happening there. That project is on the back burner because of COVID. Yeah, yeah. You can't play. We did do a gig on uh, that channel TV last last week, actually. But there's okay. It's really, it's really protocol, you know. And there's nobody in the room. The right, camera, right. all the masks on and stuff. But uh, but we really decided it's it's very very much a project that needs to be promoted by playing gigs. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, you know, we do have a we did a, we did a wonderful video. Um, for the first song, we did a cover of Sly and the Family Stone. I, I watched that. People. That was really yeah. well done. Neither are you. We are the same. Whatever we do. You love me. You hate me. You know me. And then still can't figure out from back I'm in. I'm every day people. Yeah, well, that's, that was a, a video, a friend of ours who, who sadly passed away, you know, oh, uh, at, the end, at the end of 2019. His name's Tom Amorian, and oh, uh, he did a lot of videos for me. He did my Be Creative video. He also did uh, Turning Around the Sun, which is one of my, my songs. He's, he was really, I just loved his work. He's so good. Yeah, uh, so well, He did Everyday video. People before he left the planet, luckily. And that's, that's out there. But we haven't really, we, we decided just to keep everything boiling away. 
you know, it's just hit on the back burner, as they say, yeah. until, until this is all over. And then we're going to like, we, we've got enough songs for another album too. Oh, okay. Just, you know, it's really, um, a lot of, it's a very prolific uh, situation. And uh, you released a single, uh, Precious Love, that, that came out. Yeah, just, uh, yeah, that was a, that was a, um, long ago. that was a COVID, uh, as an example of how you can be creative in COVID times. Sure. Right? Yeah, yeah, I, have I, to be. I, mean, um, I know people know this now, but uh, at the time I thought, I'm, I want to get, I want to get the A team on this record because normally I play everything myself on most, especially during COVID, I'm playing everything. Yeah. Um, but uh, I wanted to get Bill King on keyboards and oh Paul, wow, he's yeah, he's great. Paul he's DeLong great. on drums nice. and uh, Gene Hardy on sax and a fabulous singer I I know called Taylor Abrahams. He's got a really good voice. So I got those four people to all just to send in their performances. I sent them an MP3. Yeah, yeah. And they sent me back. Paul DeLong sent me a, you know, like a Pro Tools session with all wow. drums, you know. And uh, it's easy. It's very easy to sync because it's all digital. Sure, sure, yeah. yeah. It wouldn't work on analog because analog, yeah. you know, moves. So, but digital yeah. is fine. So, yeah. so, and I just mixed it here on my, you know, at home, and it's. Uh, it's got 40, uh, nearly 50,000 views on YouTube. So it's pretty good. Excellent. Oh, that's great. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, so, so that's my own personal single. And then, I, and then I've got a new, a new single out uh, by The Happy Campers, which is my collective band name. I've got two, I've got two bands. I've got The Three Spirits and I've got The yeah, Happy yeah. Campers. And The Happy Campers is basically, they're all funny songs. They're, they're okay. songs about sort of uh, issue I've got the next single is going to be Icky it's called Icky Cottage it's a rock song about renting a terrible place as we do you know and you get there and there's dead, there's dead mouse in the door and that sort of stuff you know it's a really funny song and then the, the single after that is called I'm a big fan of myself so it's a really funny song about, <laughs> how you, about appreciating who you are you know so um, do, you, uh, do you know Wendell Ferguson? no uh, no Fergus Hamilton. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Guy. Wendell Ferguson's a very well uh, one of probably Canada's top uh, guitar players, more in the in in the country field. Yeah. But uh, he's he's a he's a a funny guy too, and uh, oh, he, he, he he did a couple kind of you know funny Fun tongue and cheek kind of albums. Uh, you guys might uh, might get along <laughs> get along did, did really you, well. Did you actually put me in contact with him? I, I I'd love I, to. Yeah, I would yeah. like him to, I'd like him to play as a guest on. I'm, I'm a big fan of myself. Yeah, he's he's a funny he's a guy, player. and uh, yeah, like I said, one of Canada's top players. Yeah, uh, he, heavy he, session guy. Uh, been on countless albums. Yeah, well, I was, I was lucky enough to get Rick Emmett on. My big, yeah, yeah, you know, he, he knows he can play a few songs. <laughs> oh, he's really, he's really good. I was, I was amazed how good he was. Yeah, he was really good. He played on two tracks on there, and I got um, Blue Rodeo's drummer, Glenn Milchan. So, on. before you came to Canada, did you know? Uh, no, I didn't know you, anybody. I, so, you I, didn't I, know who Triumph was, or yeah, you know, wow. I never heard of Blue Rodeo, I never heard of Triumph. You know. <laughs> And I just managed crazy. to find him. So it's my partner at the studio, David Bray, knows just about everybody. So he yeah, helped, yeah. Me a lot. He helped me a lot to, you know. Wow, well, you're, you're you're finding out Canada's got tons of amazing world class talent here. You don't need to. Uh, you can travel the world without leaving the city. Yes. Yeah. Which is, yeah. Which is what one of the things I really like about it. So uh, yeah. Well, and you yeah. found Tristan too. I mean, that guy's uh, yeah. He's a monster player. He's, a, he's good, a good, good enough that Brian May hired him. I mean, like really. <laughs> yeah. He's, yeah. He can, this man can play anything, and but he's also a really good songwriter. Have you heard any of his? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, because he used to play his own songs down at my. He was a guest at my one twenty diner gig. I played there for okay. two years in the residency. Oh, maybe when he went under his kind of alias Waters or something. Yeah. As Waters. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah, that's it. He's he's a he's done some very very unusual original songs. Yeah, yeah. 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 It needs to be heard. And, you know, I think he's. Excellent. I think he's been down in the dumps a bit at the moment because he's not able to do what he's really good at, which is... Oh, he's the top theatre guy. But he's, uh, he, he left. He, he, he moved out uh, 
just recently. So I think he's, he's, got, uh, he's gone to Iowa somewhere, isn't he? Uh, yeah, and eventually he's, I think he's moving to Nashville. So uh, he'll oh, okay. kind of get up and running. A lot of a lot of the states are well, Nashville's fully running right now. So uh, yeah, it's a good place to be. And uh, a guy like him, uh, uh, he'll he'll learn country in like a week. You know. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's, good. he's going to do. He's going to do really well down there. Yeah, yeah sure. exactly. Yeah. Anyway, uh, Chris, it's been a thrill to talk to you, and I, 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 it's, thank you so much. And a thanks to uh, Eric Elber for uh, for introducing us stuff. Uh, the stories are just fabulous. It was great to great to hear these stories. I've got loads of them. I've talked to you all night. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll meet we'll meet in person for for a pint. Oh yeah, a pint of food, <laughs> pint of food, mate. Or a good yes, up, mate. <laughs> a glass of the amber nectar would go down very well right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Take All care. Right. Oh yeah, uh, come to my show tonight. So, you know, it's, um, yes. So it's a, on Facebook, right? Yeah, Facebook Live, seven Excellent. o'clock. And All it's, right. You know, it's a good. It's a good one. You think you'll like it? All right, we'll do. All right. So, the theme is activism, music, and activism. Excellent. Right. Well, take care, Chris, and thanks right, again. All right. See you then. Signing off.